you have the right to be happy. People want you to be down, to be sad all the time. In a society that people want us black women to be sad, to be, you know, not in good spaces, to be happy as a way to confront racism, actually. They did everything to make us sad and you were happy. So for me, it was very important to listen to that. Yes, being a happy black woman, it's a very revolutionary thing. I'm Taylor Cassidy. I'm a content creator and I create content on black history and I love black history. I am Jamila Ribeiro. I am a Brazilian writer and professor. What are, what is race? Wow. It seems to be a simple question, but it's not. Um, race is um, something that was used to separate, to create oppression. When they created the category Negro, you are Negro, you are different, you are not human, you serve it to this or to that. So race, of course, it's a biological concept. We understand that. But it's very important to, uh, to us to understand race in a social um, perspective because race was used historically to oppress mm. people and to oppress different kind of human beings. I agree. And I think it's important for people to take that notion of race into perspective because um, in the U.S. Census, if you look back, you'll see that Irish immigrants were labeled as black as well, just because they were put into a category of, oh, if you're not completely white, just labeled as mm -hmm. black. So that goes to show how subjective and man-made the concept of race is. Yes, yeah, very important what you're saying, because in Brazil, for example, we are, yes, we are mixed people. The majority of the population is black, but there are a lot of black people that are light-skinned. And for a long time, because of the denial of racism in Brazil, these people, they couldn't see themselves as black for a long time. So we are not black because we are not so dark. You are moreno, you are this mm -hmm. or that. So, but also in Brazil, there are indigenous people. And sometimes people don't talk about the indigenous people. They don't understand that also there is a, a large population, 205 ethnicities of indigenous people, and they are not bringing sometimes these people to these conversations. And I think it's very important because it, we, we want to label people all the time and we do not understand um, the, or, the real origin of uh, determinate groups. There are a lot of um, Afro-Brazilian people struggling to live, a lot of intellectuals, the black movement, but also the indigenous movement, and how it's important to us to, to not create more walls. You need mm -hmm. to create these conversations, these bridges, and to talk and to learn from other people. How these people define themselves? You have to stop to define people. This, this, we need to define ourselves, we have the right to define ourselves. Right. So I really agree with you. You are very active on social media. I have the opportunity to see, and I think it's, you are doing a great work because you are, you know, educating people. And what do you think it's uh, that people can do to, you know, to change, to transform the society? Not only black people, because usually white people they think that they are not part of their mm. conversation, but they are part of their conversation yeah. because as Grada Quilomba, an um, intellectual that I really, enjoy, I really like, she says that racism is a white problematic. So sometimes white people, they don't think they, they don't have, they, they don't think that they have to be part of this conversation. So in your opinion, what people can do mm. to, to change things? I think everybody has a role. I think with racism and discrimination, you're either affected by it, you're either a part of it, or you benefit from it. And Perfect. I think recognizing that first is something everybody can do, and that's through reading other perspectives. That's through listening to podcasts, educating yourself through documentaries about the history and viewpoints that people have made from that history. I think the second thing that's very important for people to know is that they have the tools right where they're at to make change locally. And I'd say start with what you have and start with where you are. It doesn't matter 
where you're at, who you are, you can use the tools in your arsenal to educate other people around you. Once you've educated yourself first, you can take advantage of the things in your city, the things in your neighborhood. There are many, many organizations that you can volunteer at. And I think that making yourself active in that way will also serve to let you learn better about your world and be able to fight racism and not just say you can say you fought racism, but actually mm -hmm. truly believe it and have it in your soul. And that honestly will make you a better person and a better have a better outlook on life and be able to respect people better, be able to connect with people as the humans that they are. And I think that's the most important thing to create a world that is peaceful. What do you think? I totally agree with you. Wow. I totally agree because sometimes um, people, they think they don't have to educate themselves. So I say it's not an easy process. So you, you don't have to stop in the middle because it is difficult. Yes, it is difficult when you ra we raise our readiness, when we learn about the other peoples, when you learn about how uh, the society treats determinate groups. So it, it's um, a process for, it's all life process. Yeah. Everybody can be part of it. And I think it's very important to white people to understand the responsibility. It's not only about feel guilty, don't feel guilty, feel responsible. And people that are, I don't know, in the um, institutional levels, if people are thinking about public policies, it's very important to study about race if these people that are creating public policy. Absolutely. To not reproduce this idea that, oh, I am thinking about everybody, but who is everybody? We needed to name the reality. We needed to name there that are black people, there are indigenous people, there are women. We needed to name to be able to create public policies, to emancipate these people. Otherwise, you are still, you know, all the time going to this universal idea of the subject and we needed to name the realities. Right. So, but education for me, there is an important, is an important uh, fundamental role to mm. face races. But I really, really think that we needed to continue to create public policy. You, you can't stop right. how it's going on now in the United States, how in Brazil people are trying to, oh no, it was enough. You know, we needed to continue to fight for that. And to finish, I wrote a book that is a best selling in Brazil, the Anti-Racist Manual. And people ask me about to be an anti-racist. And I say, you know, to be an anti-racist is not a lifestyle. You need to understand that you cannot support um, projects, political projects that um, are against the, the reivindications of black people if you want to be an anti-racist person. You cannot be anti-racist if you do not support black lives. Yeah. You cannot be anti-racist if you vote for some people mm. that are against black people. So it's very important to think in this big thing, this big scenario. It's not about to be a cool person that go on social media sometimes and write something. Mm -hmm. It's about your actions. I feel like there's this, there's a verse in the Bible where it's like, um, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that treasure can also be applied with time. I feel like whenever you pour your time into learning something, whenever you pour your time into investing yourself in a topic, whether that be about history, whether that be about public policy, your heart will follow. Mm -hmm. Your heart Perfect. will be invested in it and that will make way for your actions as well. So if somebody wants to learn how they can care more, how they can learn more empathy, put your time into it first. Mm -hmm. You said that in Brazil, there's an idea that, oh, racism doesn't exist there. There mm -hmm. are no racists there. Can you tell me more that, about that? Because I've never heard about that from, from Brazil. Yes, but it's usually the image that people have from Brazil is it's a nice country. It's a very happy country. Or this view of sexualization of Brazilian women. But, but actually, Brazil is a very violent country. Brazil was the last country in America to, to end slavery. In the post-abolition time, uh, Brazil, Brazil states didn't create any kind of public policy, any kind of reparation policies. So today in Brazil, most of the black population in Brazil is poor. 
and we are still struggling for policies, affirmative actions. In the mm-hmm. past few years, there were some politics like affirmative actions in education. I'm the first person in my family to go to university because of this, due to these policies. So it was very important. But of course, we need more. We mm-hmm. needed to, all these years, denying racism. You know, we were not racism only in the United States or South Africa because there, there is segregation. In Brazil, there is no segregation. Of course, there was not a, um, a segregation by law, but actually in Brazil, there is an institutional segregation because if you go to a public university in Brazil, the public universities are the best. Most of the people there are white people mm. coming from wealthy family. If you go to a favela in Brazil, to a slum in Brazil, you see most of people who live there are black. So actually, there is a segregation in Brazil. There is not law to determine that, but there is a segregation. And I think it's very important to to look up to Brazil in this perspective, to face this idea, this romantic idea about Brazil. Mm. There's a relation that I see with affirmative action and the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this idea that affirmative action isn't needed anymore because racism is healed and racism is fixed. But and how is that in the United States now? <laughs> exactly. I feel like saying that racism is fixed, especially in America of all places, is a very audacious thing to say. Mm-hmm. And so we I feel like we see the same things that you might see in colleges and universities, the same thing in the U.S., how the elite universities mm-hmm. and Ivy Leagues, most of them are still majority white. And these affirmative action plans are the ones continuing to promote diversity and help people who have been born into the after effects of racism in maybe low income places or maybe places that don't have great schooling, but they are brilliant student. Mm -hmm. Those programs in place are the ones that put them in the places that they can grow and that they can thrive. So I definitely see the correlation between pretending like racism doesn't exist Mm -hmm. anymore just to ignore how while segregation isn't in law anymore it still exists socially and that's still just as important to address and how is for you now you are in university can you tell us about your experience in university i think that while i go somewhere that's still ethnically diverse i still feel the need to have a space to let my guard down Mm-hmm. and not be on defense of expecting all the time you know what i mean mm-hmm. so have you felt that way in the spaces that you've been in um, for sure it's very and people do not understand how difficult it was it's for us to be in in spaces that most of the people they don't look like us how we feel and how we have to prove all the time that you deserve to be there that's why i think it's so important to discuss races in a psychological way how uh, racism can impact our self-esteem, the way we see ourselves. And for me, it was difficult, this process. During my childhood, my parents, they were black people. My sister, my brothers, they are black. In my family, there is no problem. But then I went to school, and there the other children were calling me names. So for me, it was how to deal with that since a very young child, I was six years old, and people saying, you are ugly, your hair is not beautiful, I'm not going to participate in activities with you. So for me, it was a process. I always say, I always say that the black women saved me because I had the opportunity to work in some organizations uh, run by black women, and it was very important to me, you know, to read Toni Morrison when I was 19 years old and to read the bluest eyes and yes. oh my god and then my angelou and then the brazilians have reference that i have like conceição evaristo luisa bai who's in oh my god so it was very important to me to see myself through them it's so important when we see each other when you read books that you know tell about you you see oh my god i'm not crazy i'm not <laughs> alone a lot of women who paved the way saved my life, and I think 
we uh, my generation i am 42 years old it's important to continue and your generations you have this duty you know as to 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 bring this history of a lot of people that were doing incredible things in the past but the history didn't tell about them right i actually watched a little bit of your ted talk mm -hmm. um and you talked about how when you were a little girl you were very talkative mm -hmm. and then whenever you went out into the world you started to silence yourself mm -hmm. because people were pressuring you to be silenced. Mm -hmm. And I felt I related to you in the exact same way. I was very talkative, very extroverted. But in middle school, um, I also started to become a little quieter, and you know, make myself shrink down a little more because maybe, just maybe, um, I can conceal my blackness a little more or mm -hmm. I can conceal the way I wear my hair or the way I was a little bit taller than anyone else. I'm a little shorter now, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but I related to you in that way. And by reading about Maya Angelou, Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, I found ways to find my voice again. So I feel like literature and sharing the voices of specifically black women is crucial mm -hmm. for our youth to grow up feeling seen and grow up feeling like they have a different destiny than just being silenced. Yes, this is this is great. Because I said in that TED talk, I was not shy, I was silenced. I couldn't be myself actually in school. And the, the teachers, they are not prepared to deal with all that situations. For many times when I complain, oh, but it's just a joke. Sit there, this mm -hmm. is just a joke. So when people don't listen to them, when they do not embrace what we are feeling so what do you do you you silence yourself so i i'm not going to say uh, anything anymore I'll be quiet here that's why these women like tony morrison who is my best author ever i love tony <laughs> morrison and how for me it was like oh i'm not going to be silenced anymore i have to talk I, of course people will not like of course a lot of people will tell you, it, it, they still tell me today on social media and every space, oh, be quiet, mm. what you're talking about. But I, you know, but I know who I am, so I don't care if these people are trying to silence me because right. now I know who I am. Now I have the confidence to be who I am, to do what I want to do. And when I read the, the stories of these women, all of them, they had a lot of difficulties to be themselves. Right. So it's not a problem of a Jamila's or a Taylor problem. It's a problem of most of black women, not only in the United States, but also in Brazil, but also in different countries. So I think for me today, to be able to be myself, it's a way to honor my mother because she couldn't, mm. to honor my grandmother because she couldn't, because she had to work to survive. I didn't have the opportunity to ask my grandmother what were her, your dreams, you know? So my grandmother and my mother, they came from generations that they couldn't dream. So today I can dream. So when I dream, when I, um, I go forward to do the things I want to do, it's a way to honor them. Mm -hmm. What would you have to say to black women who are maybe older or at a place in their life where they feel like they don't have the right to dream or they don't have any any hope to dream what would you say to them to encourage them that yes you can yes you can keep going yeah yes you can of course uh, people around you you say that you are crazy that you are not that you are old that you cannot do this it's not so to you because we're very old to that of course people you say that but i think we needed to hear our inner voice you know you have to look more inside of us instead um, what other people are saying. Because sometimes these people, they don't even know what they are saying. Or sometimes they are so frustrated, frustrated in their own lives. Sometimes they are, you know, people who believe it in this oppression discourses. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think it's so important to look inside, to read these people, these women that did a um, great job and it is very important to learn from them because, you know, my grandmother, she didn't have the opportunity to study, but she knew how education was important. 
And and I think it's important to us to to be connected with this kind of people, with this kind of messages, because all the time people will try to make you to give up. Mm-hmm. But you cannot believe in that. Have to believe in you. You have right. and to feel that you are not alone, and to create safe spaces with other women. It's very important to have people you can trust. You can talk about what you are feeling, because most of us as black women, you know, we think that you have to be strong all the time. So my message is that you you don't have to be strong all the time. We needed to be strong because the society is very violent to us. So you didn't have any options. You mm-hmm. had to go and do and do that. But you are human beings. Right. It's very important to us to understand that you can be vulnerable. And I say, no, it, during my path, it was very difficult sometimes. Sometimes I had to cry, to ask for help. And it was difficult to me. Oh, I ask for help. People think that I'm not strong enough. That I'm weak. Yeah, yes. But I think as black women, you needed to find these places that we can be ourselves. So I think it's that's it to believe in yourself, but also to not put this image that you are a strong person all the time, because yeah. it's part of the dehuman, dehumanization of racism. To treat us not as human beings, and I'm just a human being, and I want to be a human being mm-hmm. with all my contradictions, with all my um, qualities, with all the things I have good, but I have bad. I am, I am a human being. I have the right to make mistakes. Right. I have the right to, you know, to, to, to be weak and to feel vulnerable. It's very interesting that you say that because I, just, I was just watching a TikTok where um, there was this woman who was talking about how she even has to catch herself whenever she's talking about the history of racism or learning about new um, things in history that are cruel or terrible that have been done against black women, she's had to catch herself in saying, well, duh, or like, oh, well, yeah, of course that happened, instead of l- allowing yourself to have that shock or have that sadness. And you said that that normalization of having to be strong and having to ex- always expect um, terrible things to happen to you mm-hmm. is a dehumanization process because then you're expected to have bad things happen to you. People are expected to not have to have as much empathy over you. Mm-hmm. And I even I have to do that too, you know. I've had to let go of my pride and ask for help and cry in front of somebody. Even I was talking to my Nana and she was like, she wants black women to have the soft life, as she calls it, wow. to, have, um, to have ease and to have places to laugh and be playful, be joyful, be carefree without always having our guards up. And literally I've written down in my, I keep a monthly journal and Mm -hmm. I've literally written down, let your guard down. Because I found that as I'm growing more into a young woman that I constantly have my guard up over something, over something, what is it, something. And I feel like we as black women and black women all over the world at this point we deserve to have that off. Mm -hmm. And we deserve for laws and systems to support that and finally be able to live the life that our ancestors fought for and that our ancestors didn't even imagine. Mm -hmm. And I I truly believe that. We deserve the soft life. And we deserve not feel guilty when good things happen. Because sometimes you feel guilty. Yes. And uh, and I come from an Afro-Brazilian religion called Candomblé. And in Candomblé in Brazil, they teach us um, to confront the guilty. Because sometimes you are living a good life, but the people around you are not, or your relatives, and sometimes you feel guilty. I don't deserve. Why me? Mm. And it is very important to us to break this kind of uh, cycles in our minds because we deserve to be happy. We deserve to have good things. The inequalities, the oppressions, they took that from us. But it's a right. So for me, it was very difficult to deal with this process. You know, I was feeling guilty and my religion was very important to me to say, well, to be happy today, it's a way to honor your ancestors. You have the right to be happy. People want you to be down, to be sad all the time. In a society that people want us black women to be sad, to be, you know, not in good spaces, to be happy as a way to confront racism. 
actually. They did everything to make us sad and you were happy. So for me, it was very important to listen to that. Yes, being a happy black woman, it's a very revolutionary thing, you know, because they are doing every time, every single thing to make you feel bad about yourself and you are not feeling bad about yourself. What's going on? So I think it's important to us to understand as black women that we have, we deserve, we have the right to, to happiness. We deserve to be happy. And sometimes, when I say that, I'm not talking about huge things. Sometimes for me, what makes me happy? We have to ask this question because as women, we are always taking care of other people all the time, but nobody take care of us. And sometimes it's difficult to, to us to let people take care of us because you are taking care of everybody. Right. So the self-care, as Audre Lord used to say, is not about, is not a um, superficial thing. Actually, it's essential. Mm -hmm. I know that many women, they have different realities, but it's very important to us to ask us, what do you like to do, what I like to do, and try to do that. Mm -hmm. And for me, sometimes it's simple things. So what do you want to do? Ah, today I want to take care of my garden. I have a garden. I, I like to take care of my plants. My mom does too. And for me, it's a meditation process. I'm there, take care of my plants and things, my herbs. This make me happy. So I think you have to, to understand that, that we deserve happiness mm -hmm. as black women. That's definitely something I needed to hear. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So it sounds like when black women practice self-care, we fight racism. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Take care of yourself. It's very revolutionary. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. 